www.thecovidnineteenanswers.org for the latest information on the COVID-19 vaccines. Getting back to the moments we miss starts with getting informed. It's up to you. A message brought to you by the Ad Council and the CDC. Hi, I'm Don Glass. And I'm Yael Cassander. And we host a Moment of Science. The world is always posing questions, and science is always in pursuit of answers. A Moment of Science offers many of those answers in a timely moment of entertainment and enlightenment. We hope you'll tune in. For more information about a Moment of Science or to download our latest podcasts, visit us at a momentofscience.org. Listen weekday afternoons at 545 on KSJE. KSJE is supported by San Juan Regional Medical Center, here to meet your urgent and emergent medical needs, whether they are COVID-19 related or not. Medical emergencies happen when you least expect them. Whether it's a stroke, heart attack, illness, or injury, San Juan Regional Medical Center's caregivers are here to provide care to you and your loved ones. Find out more online at sanjuanregional.com. Ten minutes past eight o'clock. It is Thursday morning, May 6th, 2021. Good morning, everybody. I'm Scott Micklin, and thank you for tuning in to KSJE 90.9 FM over the air here in San Juan County, New Mexico, 103.3 FM over the air in Durango, Colorado, and streaming everywhere on Earth from our website at ksje.com. Welcome also to our viewers who are watching this visual radio program this morning. The video is streaming live to the KSJE Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and our Twitter account. We're glad that you are with us as well this morning, everybody, because coming up in the next few moments, my guest today, Paul Reed, is going to be here, local archaeologist, of course. He works with Salmon Ruins and Archaeology Southwest. We're talking about a very timely topic, which is the vandalism at ancient sites. We're seeing, unfortunately, seeing more and more of that. Paul will be talking with me about that, how we could protect these sites, but still allow the public to maybe visit many of them. And so how can we do that and protect them and also be careful about not loving them to death and with big crowds of the public as well. So that is our conversation this morning. It begins in the next few moments right here on KSJE. So stay tuned for that. Coming up next hour on our social media platforms at 9 this morning on the radio this afternoon at 5.06 p.m. Megan Cullop is joining me for our COVID-19 community information program. This morning we are talking about continued community needs with Catherine Abeta from the San Juan United Way. We'll get some student reflections from some local seniors from the area. And we'll be talking with the Allen Theaters about their plans to reopen the Farmington Movie Theaters for the first time in more than 13 months. But that is happening Friday. So we'll be talking about all of that coming up this morning at 9 a.m. Again, live on our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. You can watch us there or, of course, hear it on the radio later on this afternoon at 5.06 p.m. on KSJE. On the radio at 9, it's Mick Hess, of course, our Roving with the Arts classical music program. And this morning on the radio, Mick is featuring music from the wonderful Sergei Rachmaninoff. That's coming up today on Roving with the Arts. And don't forget, we invite you to connect with us on our other social media platforms platform in addition to Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Check us out on Instagram as well. It's a sunny morning here in the Four Corners outside our studios here at San Juan College. The current temperature is 50 degrees. For more on the weather, we're going to go to Rolando Yazzi, our KSJE weather intern with the latest on the forecast. Good morning, Rolando. Good morning, Scott, and good morning, everybody turning in right now on this lovely morning. Session as usual, we could see some patches of clouds, and with that, let's take a look at your five-day forecast. For today, sunny in the morning, it becomes partly cloudy in the afternoon, high of 84. Tonight, partly cloudy skies with a low of 53. Tomorrow, breezy with partly cloudy skies, it becomes a slight chance of showers and thunderstorms in the afternoon, high of 85. Tomorrow night, mostly clear, with breezy conditions with a low of 50. Saturday, breezy, not as warm, but partly cloudy skies, high of 74. Saturday night, mostly clear, low 43. Sunday, mostly sunny, but becoming partly cloudy in the afternoon, high of 71. 
Sunday night, partly cloudy skies with a level 47. And on towards Monday, mostly sunny, could be a slight chance of rain showers later in the day, high of 70. And for Monday night, partly cloudy skies with level 42. I'm Alonzo Yaku, your part of your Friday outlook on the 90.9 KSUE. Have yourself a wonderful week, and thank you for your support. Thank you, Rolando, and thank you very much. And we want to wish uh, Rolando a hearty congratulations because he has gone ahead and graduated from the CLEAR program here at San Juan College. He was uh, all decked out in his uh, graduation robe and mortarboard and came by the station yesterday. So, Rolando, thank you very much for being here with the weather for, with me for the last several weeks. We really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, Scott. Thank you. You're welcome. And congratulations to you, and keep up the great work, okay? Right on, sir. All right. That's Rolando Yazzi. Congratulations. Joining me here, our weather intern on KSJE. And now let me turn to my guest who is with us this morning from his home in the Taos area, Paul Reed from Archaeology Southwest and Salmon Ruins. Paul, good morning. Always great to have you on the program, of course. Good morning, Scott. Glad to be back on with you. You bet. Thank you very much. And so we've come up with this kind of timely topic, um, unfortunately. Uh, and I know this it's really gets under your skin a little bit too when we talk about these vandalisms at various sites across the world um, but it just seems to me like we're seeing more of these recently than we have um, in years past and maybe correct me if I'm wrong is that not what we're what's happening do you think yeah I think so plus you know in our age of instant media I think we learn about these things much more quickly than we did maybe even 10 years ago true um, yeah, there has there has seems to have been a rash of these incidents lately, and it's just just unfortunate. Right, and I guess some folks might say, but people have been looting and vandalizing sites for hundreds of years, right? I mean, you've seen that if you discover a new um, spot and you're looking through it, there's maybe evidence of uh, of looting that may have happened even a century ago, correct? Yeah, that's true, and it, it unfortunately, really, in some cases, is. You know, as soon as um, European folks came into the area, there started to be some disturbance of, of these areas, and, and some that's even earlier than that. So, yeah, um, but, you know, even with the history and a long history, unfortunately, we still need to pay a lot of attention to this and, and try and continue our education and outreach efforts. Um, you know, because there are cases where people uh, inadvertently damage sites. Um, you know, sometimes people casually pick up artifacts. We've talked about that in, in prior shows. And, you know, so a lot, of the, a lot of the impacts we see tend to be from just sort of casual, you know, behavior by people and folks who really don't know the impacts of what they're doing. You know, these specific cases that we're going to talk about this morning, um, you know, there's nothing casual or inadvertent. This is deliberate um, destruction. Right of ancient petroglyphs and you know in both of the cases so yeah and i guess i would say that you would think these days that people should know better right if they're out in these areas that, that they should know that there are apt to be some of these ancient sites they certainly i mean petroglyphs you can see that they're there obviously um and so we should really know better as we're as we're going out to try to enjoy these things but let's talk about those two specific uh instances one of which um actually both happened in utah and one was a climbing incident correct and and remind us of what happened there this was just maybe a week or so ago right yeah this is an individual who put in a climbing bolt a support that you know climbers use although more and more these days climbers are very aware of things and even in areas where we don't have any petroglyphs or other rock art a lot of times climbers avoid it but this guy pounded in a, a pretty good bolt right into a petroglyph panel um, and it was subsequently removed. They know who did it. So in this case, um, this, this really was just, just a careless act, um, but probably more than likely not in, in, you know, a deliberate attempt to cause an impact to that panel. Um, you know, but I think in some ways this might be a reflection of people, you know, less connected to what the rest of us understand about the world. Um, you know, I kind of call this, uh, in other contexts anyway, sort of uh, alternative views of reality. You right. know, people are not aware of their surroundings and they're not so connected to one community or another. And, you know, and, and different folks in different communities pursue what they want to do. And they're not always thinking. They don't always have the radar out for things. So this individual, I think, is going to be asked to do some community service, hopefully. 
that will contribute directly to other people learning more about, um, you know, how to avoid these types of impacts. So, so I think in, in this case, even though it was an unfortunate incident, we may see a positive outcome right. on the other side of it. Well, that would be good, and that's certainly what we all hope for. And, it's, and to me, it seems a bit of, of selfishness, too, I guess, too. And I think that's what you're getting at is just that, you know, it's, it's all about me, and I'm going to put my bolt where I want to put my bolt. And if I damage something, right. oh, oh, well, it's easier than, than to picking another path up this cliff. I don't know. I'm not a mountain yeah, it's, or a cliff it's climber, so I don't know. Yeah, it's possible the individual really didn't know that, you know, and it, that he was looking at a possible. rock art panel at gloves, but... You know, they're very obvious. Um, there are obviously subtle examples across the Southwest and the West where sometimes people really don't know what they're looking at until the sun hits it right. But this this one was very obvious. So, yeah, yeah I think it was kind of a me first, you know, stuck in my own head, doing my own thing um, type situation. But, again, I, I hope we can get a bounce from education and, you know, and, and on a number of uh, – friends Facebook pages and friends of friends, you know, climbers have really jumped on this and uh, kind of universally, um, you know, heap some criticism on this individual, which I think is deserve it. Sure. You know, for, funny things about it, I think it was a, uh, you know, the way climbers rank things, I think it was a 5-4 pitch. So a couple of my friends who are, um, you know, at least pretty good rock climbers are like, oh, for a 5-4, you don't need a bolt anyway. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. It's interesting to to have folks weigh in on that with, you know, their, their own code of ethics. And I, as I said, I think that climbers, you know, coming up today, you know, in the last couple of decades, they really try hard when they're out to minimize their impacts because for them, the challenge increases if they can go up a steep pitch, you know, and just find the cracks and, and avoid any, any kind of aid whatsoever. So, so that's a good thing, and I and I hope this individual is is just you know a rarity, you know. Yes. And and uh, based on what we know, this doesn't happen very often. So. Well, that's um, good. Yeah. That's good to hear. And and of course, we've always heard, even even me, um, you know, the leave no trace for even when we're hiking or you know going on trails and staying on the trails and 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 all those things. So this just seems to be an extension of that, right? When we're talking about rock climbers and. And things along that line, as you mentioned, trying to maybe uh, diminish their impact on on the cliffs that they're climbing. Absolutely, I mean, for every any of all of us who enjoy outdoor recreation, this this is the way to go. You know, you pack things in, you pack them out, you leave nothing out in these natural areas. You know, all your trash, everything goes back with you. You know, if you're riding. If you're on, you know, just a uh, mountain bike, then you try your best to avoid damage, maybe avoid some eroded areas. So, yeah, there's, I, I, I do think there's a pretty strong code of ethics for a lot of outdoor recreationalists. Um, unfortunately, you know, we do, based on other things we've learned, we have more and more garbage being deposited in areas, public areas where people camp. So we definitely need to continue the campaign to right. raise awareness. Very true. Well, and I think, again, more people are discovering that, uh, you know, it's, it's a great exercise. It's a great way to get out and see the great natural beauty of our, of our area, of our state, of our region. And, and, of course, as we do that and attract more people to it, then we attract more of those negative things, as you mentioned, the trash, the potential for problems. And so that brings us to the other incident that I wanted to ask you about. That was, again, in, in Colorado, a site called Birthing Rock. And perhaps you can give us an idea of, of what that site is kind of what it's known for and then we'll talk a bit about the incident yeah it's uh you know it's it's one that specific panel that's called birthing rock has a number of different petroglyph petroglyphic icons that go back into the archaic period several thousand years ago through the pueblo period a thousand fifteen hundred years ago and then into more recent um you know utes culture um rock art that was put on it so it's, you know, like a lot of the areas we have where rock art is prevalent, this, this records thousands of years of human history um, in, you know, in different ways. Um, and, of course, there's been a lot of work, I think we've talked about this on prior shows, in trying to sort of decode the images and figure out what we're looking at. So, you know, but this is a totally non-replaceable link to you know, the incredible history in the Southwest, and in this case, in Southeast Utah, 
not too far from Moab. Um, and one of the, the panel in particular, um, you know, is, is thought to represent a birthing incident, you know, so someone recording, um, perhaps a woman, the logical recording an incident of birth on this rock and sort of enshrining it through time. So, you know, a very, very important to um, Native American folks in the area, and really all of us should appreciate this and honor this. So what happened in light of that was particularly appalling, you know, with some white supremacist graffiti put on, um, you know, scratching then over the top of um, the specific birthing panel icon, and, you know, just, just really the height of this, you know, disrespectful behavior. Um, the only thing worse would have been to have had this, you know, this image literally detonated or something. So right. these are the kind of things that, you know, both make my heart hurt and just, yeah. just really get my Irish ire up too. Um, because there's nothing inadvertent or accidental. This was an intentional act of destruction. Um, these are fortunately also pretty rare in the world, but, um, you know, this, they're going to pursue you know, this investigation, this was on um, Bureau of Land Management or BLM lands, and, you know, they put out information via Facebook, all the social media, they have a $10,000 reward out, so um, I think this individual ultimately will be found and, and hopefully made to, you know, do some restitution and, and again, you know, raise awareness levels. Um, there's a lot of places individuals can um, express themselves, shall we say, um, and this, you know, this was an incredibly inappropriate and disrespectful example of that right we're showing a picture of the uh, of the site that the blm has done some treatment <clears throat> to the the surface of the rock i think to try to minimize the uh impact of of it as they kind of study it to figure out how best to maybe restore or protect what's left or those other types of things and i can imagine you know all the work that goes into trying to stabilize and then restore something like this but i'm sure you do yeah, I mean, definitely not my specialty, but this is, you know, because of incidents like this and, and other things, you know, there's a, there's a very active program on, on public lands of conservatorship. And so they have, they're going to engage some specialist individuals to hopefully get this panel back as close as possible to an original state or, you know, or at least the state it was in prior to the damage. Um, so yeah, fortunately the, those, those types of specialists exist in the world, um, you know, and, and sort of, you know, graffiti, you know, countrywide worldwide is, is, is an issue. And so we have specialists now who can remove these types of things from many, many locations. Um, That's yeah, great. sort of, a, good. you know, and uh, the, not the kind of work you want, but it exists. So indeed, yeah. and from the picture we're showing, Paul Reed, I mean, there's a little. There seems to be some fence around the the rock to keep the public at a, at a somewhat of a distance, right? But obviously, it's not right. anything that would keep you from obviously anybody from going up and uh, vandalizing that uh, that location. And I guess that brings us me to the next part of our conversation this morning, which is. Um, you know, protecting these sites. There's probably not a ranger or someone from the BLM standing there watching everybody 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so, you know, a lot of these sites um, are on the honor system, aren't they? I mean, compared to like Chaco Canyon or Aztec Ruins, it does have a, a you know, some staff that are that are there. Um, a lot of these sites that are that are open to the public are are just there and um, subject to the whims of the public. I'm afraid. That's right, and 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 particularly in these remote locations on BLM lands, um, you know, one of the things that I like and and others enjoy as well is going out to these areas at different times of the year, different times of the day, and then being able to enjoy experiencing sites rock art panels, other things, you know, with, with no crowds around. So that is definitely a value for those of us who love, you know, the empty spaces of the West. But as you said, Scott, the other side of that is there's, there's not the law enforcement presence um, to really adequately deal with this. Um, the number I read, and, and for the specific BLM, you know, territory in Southeast Utah, it's almost 2 million acres. They have one LE guy person who's on the scene, and certainly other BLM personnel here and there. But um, there's no way to patrol all these sites. Um, you know, the, the barrier fence that's in the photo acts as some type of a reminder for the public, don't get too close. You know, the other thing well-meaning, interested people do a lot of times is they touch, you know, these panels, these ancient um, 
petroglyphs and pictographs and the oils and things from our hand then encourage bacterial growth and in some cases just physical removal particularly if, if they're pictographs that are painted on so every time someone touches these there's pretty large potential for impact and you know and folks who've been around and understand the ethic know not to do that but I can't tell you how many times I've been at you know somewhat more visited ones where you can you used to be able to get close and you've got somebody up there with some paper doing a rubbing and all that well that's a that's a big impact on right. these resources so you know if folks want to photograph them we've all got these you know 10 megapixel cameras in our pockets now if they want to sketch them do other things you know there's many ways to enjoy you know these amazing vestiges of the past um, but touching them is, is, you know, strictly verboten and really shouldn't be happening. Um, you know, the alternative to the, the barrier, you know, the real mild barrier fence we see in the photo is some kind of big, ugly chain link fence, which, you know, wouldn't allow for even photographs to be taken, you know, in an unobstructed way. So, you know, and I don't think many of the federal land managers want to go to that step. Plus, you know, there's hundreds of thousands. I think I was um, doing some research. I am currently doing work on, you know, across the West, the 12 Western states, including Alaska. And my estimate is there's something like between 10 and 15 million archaeological historic sites. So um, many of these are undiscovered and they're protected. Um, but the point in throwing out the number is there's no possible way these can be all be fenced off and contained and patrolled. So you know, some of the patrols can happen, you know, incidents like this raise awareness, which is great, um, but we just have to continue, you know, pretty patient but persistent education efforts so that folks understand that, you know, their single visit to a panel like this, if they get a hand on after they've been hiking in the desert and they're sweating, you know, they may well impact that in a way that it hasn't been impacted. And of course, if they put graffiti and other things on it, then the, the impacts are much, much worse. Right, indeed. My guest this morning is archaeologist Paul Reed. He works with Salmon Ruins, of course, and Archaeology Southwest throughout our region, of course. We were talking about vandalism of uh, ancient sites, how to protect them, how to keep the public from loving them to death, and that maybe leads me to that part of the conversation, Paul, as we hear about, you know, really popular sites in the West and elsewhere, like Grand Canyon comes to mind. Um, you know, Chaco Canyon, for as remote as, as it is, gets... Tens of thousands of visitors each year, at least the latest numbers that I saw. Aztec ruins, of course, same same type of thing. Um, so that's another thing for managers, park managers, to to deal with, right? And I imagine they ask for input from archaeologists like yourself as to how best to minimize public impact while still being able to enjoy these great uh, these great places. Right. That's that's really the huge balancer at this point, and I think you know probably for really at least a hundred years, but um, you know, there's been concern about how do we allow the public to enjoy these places, um, as many folks do, but especially in the last couple decades, as population has really ramped up, you know, with the last year of the COVID shutdown and, you know, people trying to get outside more, we've had more and more people getting into public land settings, camping in areas where, you know, in some cases they shouldn't camp because there's no facilities and in other areas where the camping is allowed, but pretty serious impacts there. Um, and all this comes against the backdrop of, you know, at least a decade now of reduced federal budgets to manage our public lands. So, you know, this is just really in my mind, a perfect storm of more and more people, less money for facilities, for trail maintenance, you know, even for trash pickup in that sense, and less personnel on, out on the lands to direct people to areas where they should go. and and keep them away from areas they shouldn't go to. So, you know, that, that expression, loving these things to death, really is, um, unfortunately, right on the mark. Um, a lot of parks have gone to reservation systems, and, you know, this, of course, works pretty well, I guess. Um, you know, I'm saying that without having experienced them in the last decade or so, but <clears throat> in Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, Yosemite, and another, a number of places. Right, understood. And that would be just only allowing in a certain number of uh, tourists, visitors at one time in different areas of the park in order to not overwhelm the the resources, I guess, of those areas. Is that kind of what we're talking about? Right. And one of the approaches is, is kind of a metering thing. So when you, sure. you know, when you get access, um, 
say to drive through Yellowstone, you have a certain time frame in which you're supposed to pass through, you know, so you can show up at 10 o'clock and then, you know, you go into the park and they'll say, okay, here you go. You know, and so the idea is to reduce traffic on the roads, reduce the possibilities of running into wildlife because of course, you know, and that in the case of Yellowstone, that's one of the main attractions along with the geysers to get folks out there. So I think, you know, these kinds of, um, sort of metered reservation systems really are a way to go. Um, one of the things I like to do and have been doing for decades is, is going up into Colorado in the, you know, the warmer months and climbing 14,000 foot peaks. Um, and I just saw a story on um, two of the most popular are right outside the Denver Metro. So we've got um, Mount Evans and Mount Burstat. So you can literally, um, you know, get up at a normal time in Denver um, and drive an hour into the west into the mountains and, and climb either Evans or Burstat but they were getting so much use and unfortunately so many people not following the leave no trace model so a huge increase in garbage they've decided to go ahead and meter that and have people buy you know specific tickets and reservations and you know sort of a predictable pushback on, you know, some of the Facebook pages I was looking at where people are feeling like the West is ruined if you can't just get in your car on the spur of the moment one morning and drive somewhere and, and climb a mountain. Um, but, you know, the problem in that specific case is, you know, hundreds of people, thousands now, um, do this, you know, from June to about September. And that the traffic into these, you know, these really fragile places just, just has to be regulated. So, I think this is something that our society really needs to, you know, just to c come to terms with that ultimately a lot of the public places, the outdoor places that people love are, are going to have to have some sort of regulation in this way, a way so that, so that they're still here in 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years for future generations to enjoy. Right. Well, and as you and I have talked about numerous times, you know, there's always new things to learn about these these great sites, maybe it's with new technology, maybe it's just with new understanding of, of what we already know, um, but if they're destroyed and, and gone, that eliminates that part of the, uh, of the equation, if you will, to kind of help us uh, gain, gain a better understanding of, uh, of the folks who were here before us. Isn't that uh, true? That's right. Um, and Ultimately, we just have to think about what's in the best interest of different natural and cultural areas, you know, around the rest, around the West and around the country. And I think that has to come into the equation a lot more. This doesn't mean folks can't enjoy them, but the notion of sort of unrestrained, you know, just go out and do what you want in public lands, like, you know, some of us some folks grew up that way in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We have 350 million people in America now, so um, we are kind of past, with that level of population density, we're sort of past the point where, you know, every land is, every piece of land is open to folks in the public realm. So, but I think we can, we can be responsible about this and figure out what we want to do and still be able to enjoy these, these wonderful places. So, you know, I just think we've, we have to, Reori reorient our thinking a little bit and understand that loving them to death is is not the way to go. Let's let's love these outdoor places, but let's do it with respect. Let's follow the rules if we're outside. Let's let's pick up, you know, all the garbage that's that we're taking in, take it back. You know, I a lot of times if I'm camping in an area and I see things, I bring extra trash bags and I'll take five minutes to just do a little tiny bit, you know, of a part to make that area cleaner for the next folks who go through. So, you know, I think it's just kind of a community orientation and I would like to see more of that, you know, sort of that come back into vogue. Wouldn't that be nice? I agree. That would be wonderful. The other thing I wanted to ask you about too, Paul Reed, and this is kind of a touchy subject, I guess for me, just as a journalist, I always hate to, to think about censoring, but, you know, I, I think this is already happening, that there are some places um, that are we are uh, that are known to us as far as maybe ancient uh, ruins or settlements or things like that that have been removed from maps because of the concern that were they to be discoverable um, they would be irrevocably damaged and and so I guess you know how do we balance that right of of you know some people know about these things but others you know we can't maybe let the public or, or others know about the location because of the propensity for 
vandalism, looting, or or what have you. So we'll just keep, wipe them off of our our maps and and knowledge of them. I guess public knowledge of them. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, I think it's on the scale of oh, 15 plus years ago. Um, you know, USGS was asked to remove some of the more delicate, you know, and irreplaceable. They're all irreplaceable, but some of the more sensitive sites from their maps because, yeah, people were just simply picking up a public map and going to places. So, you know, I, you know, I, I suppose it does fall within this sort of broad category of censoring or limiting access to information. But, you know, with some of the sites, their sensitivity is so great, and um, and many are in pristine condition. So this is a different situation from visiting a site in a national park that's well-maintained, well-patrolled, you know, with very little possibility of damage happening. So, you know, I tend to, to be on the side of, you know, it's okay to take some of that information out of the public realm. There are many, many sites for folks to enjoy. But this does kind of bump up against, again, this notion of 100% free access to anything all the time. Um, that's not the world we live in right now, and it's really not a world we've lived in for a few years. So I, I don't think that's a huge impact on people's experience. Um, you know, there are websites, of course, where people share GPS coordinates for sensitive places. And, and you know, this, this is a real concern because many of these places are very important to modern Native American folks, and they're sacred sites, and they don't want those sites visited. So, you know, there are very legitimate reasons to limit access to these places um, and to keep them from damage and harm. Um, right. But again, you know, we've talked about balancing different complicated ideas in our, in our very complex, you know, 21st century society. It's something we have to talk about a lot. <clears throat> Indeed. And, um, and I understand that. And that's why it's, it's great to have a conversation to hear both sides of these, <clears throat> these very important issues. And I guess the last thing is something we talked about too, you and I, um, on the program, Paul Reed, and that's um, a place like Bears Ears, um, which is, you know, a huge chunk of land and an area with a lot of sites and a lot of great places to discover and to go hiking and exploring and, and things like that. And again, recently opened at least more more than it has been for public visitation and, and things along that line not realistic to try to you know put a ranger there or, or patrols or put a chain link fence around the entire area because it's just so huge right and so this is another area for managers and blm and others to say you know how do we protect these places but also allow the public to explore this new uh area in southern utah Right, right. And of course, <clears throat> Bears Ears has gotten caught up in politics at different points, but I think we're heading back towards, you know, a, a pretty good sized monument. It may get bigger again. Land. Right, right. And, <clears throat> but the issue then is, as you said, you know, adequate personnel funding for it. Um, you know, when monuments are designated, um, Congress needs to appropriate a certain amount of money to staff that. And when things get caught up in politics, as Bears Ears did, appropriate monies were never really put forward for that. The other challenge that I think we see is um, the difference between parks and monuments that are managed by the National Park Service, which tends to have a more robust budget, and those that are managed by BLM who are doing many, many things. Um, so really it circles back to the funding issue, um, but ultimately Bears Ears needs more fiscal resources to um, appropriately manage it. You know, they're saying that there might be 250 to 300,000 people <clears throat> visiting in a year. That's a that's a pretty high level of visitation for an area um, that really has only recently em emerged from just being BLM land status. So this is something that we really need to pay a lot of attention to and get those resources into the process because if we don't support, you know, the different managers um, in areas in the West and across the country and get funds into their hands, then the enjoyment that we all want from these areas is ultimately going to decline and and may even be curtailed. You know, in, in cases where parks aren't, don't have the funds to manage areas, they, they have to close those areas. You know, so this is something where there should be very broad bipartisan public support for BLM in particular in this area to just manage it well put up signage to let people know what's going on and, you know, to prevent some of the incidents that we've been talking about today, if you've got the presence, the federal presence out there welcoming people, but also saying, you know, we're out here and 
we're, we're wanting you to follow the guidelines and the rules. Um, I right. think that'll help in this regard. That would be great. Well, and I think there's some personal responsibility, too, for those of us that go out to enjoy these places to uh, make sure that we follow the rules and, um, you know, maybe keep our eyes open if others are, are not. And uh, maybe they need to be uh, reported, reminded to, uh, to act better. So that's, that's right. I mean, we're all this is for all of us to enjoy. And so we all can do a little citizen policing. And if we see bad behavior, call it out. I've seen people climbing on ruins in different remote spots in Chaco and elsewhere. And, you know, I'm not particularly shy about saying, hey, get off there, you know, and or following up with some information and and trying to, you know, have a positive impact come out of that. But, right. yeah, we should be keeping our eyes open for sure. Right. I guess, you know, not a time maybe for punishment, but for education for some of these folks who just maybe need need to know what the harm that they're they're doing but exactly unfortunately paul we are out of time yet again but a good topic today i I certainly always appreciate your perspectives and and information to share with our audiences so thank you very much well thank you scott great questions and yeah um let's keep the dialogue going an important topic indeed thank you paul take care that is paul reed archaeology southwest and salmon ruins my guest this morning here on ksje and i'll be back with more in just a moment everyone the time right now is 8 45.